time to conversations on social issues. We're so glad that you're able to join us at the end of this very long week. So I'd like to tell you a little bit about the series and then introduce our speaker for the day. So we hold this series every Thursday of the quarter, excluding the first and last Thursdays, because we believe it's so important to have a forum where we are able to share ideas and learn from each other's perspectives, whether or not we agree with every single thing we hear in this room, or reading the books on our shelves, or find in our databases, or hear in the news, right? So, we want this to be a wonderful learning and growing experience as we learn and share from each, with each other. If you'd like to learn more about this topic, feel free to come to me or go to the reference desk, the big desk in the middle of the room, and we'll be happy to find you some resources that are available through our library so that you can learn more. If you are passionate about a topic, I also invite you to come talk to me about getting on the schedule. We love to have faculty, students, and staff, especially students, who lead these series about topics that they are interested and passionate about. So, without further ado, please join me in welcoming our speaker for this week, Jeb Wyman, faculty. Thanks, Kimberly. Really excited to see some folks here. Uh, and I mean, Will and George and Nathan, we're going to get to meet them in a little bit. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to uh, tell you some stories about some veterans, um, a little bit about this uh, program, uh, the Veterans Humanity uh, Course, Veterans Study of Humanities. And then I want to do that for maybe about 20, 25 minutes, uh, and then bring some, some veterans from this school on uh, campus here for you guys to meet uh, and talk to me. <clears throat> so, this is Brandon. Uh, Brandon was in high school uh, on September 11th. Uh, he was of that generation, uh, that age. A lot of folks have been very angry about it. He graduated, and then that fall he was delivering pizzas. It was one of his jobs, and he delivered pizza. Uh, it was a Marine recruiter who answered the door. They gave him a pizza, and the Marine recruiter said, uh, this is uh, late 2011, he said, uh, you look like a big, strong kid. How'd you like to join the best fighting force in the world? Brandon said, no, but I'll take a free t-shirt. So he went down and he got his free t-shirt. He didn't join up until a few months later. Uh, he had a big fight with his parents. Mom said, you go out and get three job applications today. If not, I'm kicking you out of the house. Mm -hmm. You know where the story's going, guys? Mm -hmm. He came back with his signed contract to the Marine Corps. So we went into the Marines, became a Marine uh, in his unit, uh, and did deploy to Iraq. Uh, Brandon and a few others were peeled off and sent to Kuwait, where they managed an airport. Uh, so, a great deal of traffic was happening at this airport. There were flights of troops that were coming in, uh, staging there before they went into Iraq. Uh, there were troops, soldiers, sailors, Marines uh, coming out of Iraq. Lots of equipment, uh, food, the material of war. Uh, and then they also received uh, the debt. They received uh, remains uh, that came in uh, from, the, from the theater. Uh, these were cargo aircraft. Um, usually the, the bodies would come in aluminum caskets. Uh, sometimes they came in body bags. Uh, you could tell he said that sometimes it wasn't the entire person who was uh, inside the body bag because of the destructiveness of you can see he's got a lot of tattoos there. This is just another shot of him. Uh, couldn't see it, but he's got very prominently the number 226 tattooed on him. Armed, because that's the number of, we call them fallen angels that he carried, uh, received off the planes. They were spent a day uh, or more before they were transshipped to the United States. Uh, so he did that uh, during the Second Battle of Fallujah. There was over 100 in one month during that time. 
he came back and he separated from the from the Marine Corps, call it separating from the military. Soccer was his great passion. He, his dad had been, played professionally. He wanted to play in college. Uh, he was down in Portland, uh, living by himself, as so many veterans do when they come back, uh, isolating, uh, coaching soccer, uh, drinking at night. As he said, he, he uh, didn't have the nightmares when he drank, at, uh, when he drank himself to sleep. <clears throat> And one night he went to the grocery store, a convenience store actually, and he felt the car was following him. He got really quite anxious about this. Felt this car was following him. His car pulled into the same place he did, and he stayed in his car and watched this guy get out of his car, go in and get out. A great deal of anxiety. Guy left. Uh, Brandon went in, got his things. Uh, and on the way back uh, from that, from that convenience store, <clears> he <throat> passed a Kentucky Fried Chicken uh, down there in Portland. And the place had a one of those uh, sodium yellow lights that you see out in parking lots. Uh, and there was steam coming out of the building. And he said it took him right back to uh, that airport. And he started breaking down at that point. Um, and he ultimately called his mother about one in the morning. His mother was up in Seattle, Washington, four or five hours away. And she said, I will, yeah, I'm getting in the car right now. Mm -hmm. uh, we talked to her for a while. He said, I'm okay right now. Because uh, he was thinking of taking his own life. Uh, but the next, uh, next morning he got in the car and drove up to, to Seattle here and kind of started his, his journey. He's quite an advocate now on, uh, on veteran suicide. Here. Just a few more vets to tell you their stories. So this is uh, Kevin, and I met Kevin up at uh, Everett Community College. He was trying to get through math class, uh, having a great deal of difficulty. Uh, he had seen a flyer for National Guard, and his own words said, I wanted to get paid and blow shit up. I thought that would be really cool. Uh, became a 21 Bravo, which is a combat engineer. He made warrior athletes jump out of airplanes, create fields in the forests. Uh, he had been sent to Korea when the Iraq invasion happened. And like a lot of guys, felt he was really missing out. He really wanted to be part of this war. Uh, Re-upped and re-enlisted. Uh, got assigned to Fort Bragg at his request, so he could go to war. And did end up spending uh, a year in Iraq. Initially, they just had aluminum vehicles in their search for IEDs. If you know anything about metal, you know aluminum-skinned vehicle is a very dangerous thing to be in when an explosion goes off on an armored vehicle. Uh, they finally did get these very heavy vehicles called buffaloes that could withstand the blasts. Uh, spent a year driving down roads looking for every little piece of garbage, every plastic bag, every Coke can, every animal carcass, every disturbed piece of earth, every new piece of concrete that was not there uh, the day before, uh, looking for IEDs, often in places that were crowded with uh, civilians. Um, before they even left Iraq, you knew they were deploying to Afghanistan. And uh, they did do a tour in Afghanistan doing the same thing, searching for IEDs, both places, a cat and mouse game with every technique that they created, uh, jamming radio signals so cell phones couldn't be used to activate the bombs. Uh, the, uh, the people setting the bombs would always find some new technique that uh, Fox them, place it in different places, just not metal no parts, wires. Uh, so there's a constant struggle with that. Uh, he was in a uh, very, very violent operation called Operation Medusa in Afghanistan. And as he said, uh, Kevin went to Afghanistan and somebody else came back. <coughs> that was what, he, that's what he said to me. Uh, when I met him, he said I was trying not to become one of the 22. And he said, do you know what that means? I said, yes, I do. Do you guys know what that means? Mm -hmm. you know, so it refers to the uh, 
the number 22 veteran suicides per day is the, the number that's floating out there. Um, looking for work, trying to, finding education was really tough for him, didn't feel like he fit in at all in those algebra classes at the Everett College. Couldn't really connect with these other students here. Um, that's Kevin here. Robin grew up in Wisconsin, uh, really grew up in a uh, very poor family, broken home. She'd been put in foster care. She was 22 years old, this was about 1998, 22 years old. She had custody of her sister. She was working three jobs and she was going to have to drop out of college because she didn't have enough money for tuition. And the National Guard spammed her, free college, and she went in. And she went in and she loved, loved it. She loved what she got in the military. She felt she had family. She felt focused. She felt proud of herself. Uh, she scored very high on the test, kind of the, it's called the ASVAB, which is the, kind of the IQ test the military gives. She could have gone into positions with great demands like intelligence or language. Uh, the National Guard said, you're gonna be a truck driver. And so that's what she was, she drove trucks. She was actually in a small base in Germany when 9-11 happened. And the Germans in the local town came to the gates and wept, wept at the gates, brought flowers. The fence was covered with flowers and cards. She was very moving. Uh, of course, that is 2001 and 2003. Uh, the Iraq invasion happens. Uh, and uh, her unit is, is sent to Baghdad, Baghdad International Airport, uh, where they're driving trucks loaded with ammunition, food, parts, and thousands of bottles of plastic bottles of water, pallets after pallets, uh, out from the base to Baghdad to other bases in the, in the area. They get up early in the morning, in the morning, load up the trucks, go through the route and go through what's called the, the rules of engagement, the ROE. Rules of engagement. <laughs> Bombs are in dead animals. If you're driving and you see an animal carcass, avoid that. If somebody shoots at you, you can shoot back only if you can see them. If somebody is standing in the middle of the road, you're not to stop. If an Iraqi is on a bridge and you are driving under that bridge, you have to shoot. Because they're dropping bombs on the vehicles from the bridge. So one mission, that was the, the rule of engagement, shoot Iraqis on bridges. And uh, they left and they went out. And as they were coming up to an overpass, they could see that there was Somebody on this overpass, as he got closer, he could see that this was a, a boy, about five years old, about a five year old child, <laughs> leaning over this. And she was in the truck commander position, so she was in the passenger side of the truck with her weapon out uh, and aimed forward to take care of threats. And she uh, put her Aim on the on the child on the bridge, and stared at him as they got closer and closer. Her truck, her driver said, "You got a lock on him." And they got closer and closer, uh, and they drove on through. Uh, and she did not pull that trigger uh, that day. Um, she said, "I didn't do it that day. Although if I had, no one would have cared. That would have been." actually. And when he got in trouble, and that happened kind of early in my deployment, it happened later on, I may have done it because people got more, more callous uh, as the deployment went on. Uh, she came back and uh, went to Milwaukee, Wisconsin, was hanging out there, did not want to leave the house, just wanted to stay in the house and watch television. But she had a dream still of becoming an officer in the Army. It was her dream. And she was, uh, became part of this program, to, uh, an officer training program. 
Uh, and she was out in the woods in Wisconsin uh, playing army, army exercises. They had something called rubber ducks, which are rubber M16s, and they're laying and doing an ambush. Um, and she starts uh, thinking about this event in, in, in Baghdad, thinking about this boy. Uh, and uh, everyone is laying there silent. She's trying to keep down this emotion. Uh, she's unable and she starts she starts weeping. Uh, ultimately she stands up so they can't do this. Uh, she, has a, she has a breakdown there. Sergeant gets her, pulls her off, she gets composed because she really wants to become an officer. This is her dream at this point. Um, but uh, her army, her officer career is ended with that incident. And they've already started the paperwork to figure out. You cannot show weakness uh, as an officer. She lives in Pasco right now. Here. So I met Deshaun over in Olympic, at Olympic College, uh, over in Bremerton. Sean was in high school and he got a phone call from his girlfriend and she said, I'm pregnant and I'm keeping the baby no matter what. And Sean was actually excited about this. He wanted to be a dad. Um, told his mom and she said, well, now you've got to man up. You've got to do something. Basketball doesn't buy diapers. Join the military. His mom had worked for the Navy for a long time. Remember him being Navy kind of. uh, So Deshaun uh, ended up going in the Marine Corps. Uh, and he did uh, ended up doing two tours to Iraq and uh, one to Afghanistan. When I met Deshaun, uh, this wonderful, warm guy, wanted to be your friend instantly. Um, we, we made arrangements in this private room in the library over there at Olympic College. Uh, and I was talking with him for about 15 minutes, and he just started weeping. It was just all coming out. He's holding his daughter there. That was his daughter who was born uh, just before he graduated from boot camp. And uh, really what happened is uh, in Iraq, he had the... Uh, he was in an operation in, in the north. Um, the Marines were clearing houses, and they had put a tank shell into a house, uh, believing there to be insurgents inside. And uh, there was not. There were civilians inside. Um, and so uh, one thing that happened, they had to the sit there in this hot sun, waiting for a medevac helicopter to come in as this teenage girl that was infant severely injured in this, in this tank shell. And just sit there in the silence and listen to this. He doesn't know what happened to this infant, um, but he was thinking about his own daughter at, at home, he was about, about the same, same nature. So, these are the uh, effects of war, and it's not a new thing. It's just trying to change names uh, over the years here. Some of these are going to be familiar to you. I don't know if Soldier's Heart is. That's what it's called during the Civil War. Soldier's Heart. Actually, some people like that term better than our current term, it being more accurate, more evocative of what's really going on with uh, the effects of war on the human heart and human soul. Um, Tens of thousands of veterans from the Civil War came to the West and populated the western part of this country in the, in the 70s. And it made an indelible impact on our national culture um, in terms of their isolation and alienation. Uh, shell shock briefly during World War I, and it was briefly thought the impact of shells caused huge number of psychological injuries that were happening during World War I. World War II, they called it battle fatigue. In 1980, they coined this new term, post-traumatic stress. And I leave out the D word. You all know it, right? PTSD. I leave it out for a couple of reasons. I don't like 
using that term. One is that the it is it is a narrow definition in the, the DSM for now five uh, that really uh, describes reaction to imminent threat, imminent destruction, uh, kind of our most powerful reaction. And when you talk about PTSD, when you experience uh, your, your soul has experienced its intimate destruction, your brain goes into programming survival mode. It will do anything to stay alive. Anything that suggests it's going to be threatened, uh, your brain says avoid that. Uh, that's why a lot of vets come back and they, they don't go out in public. They stay in their houses. Their brain's not shutting off about it. this is a safe place. Not convinced yet. It's a narrow definition because uh, grief, sadness, uh, guilt, and something called moral injury are uh, part of the combat experience. And they are different aspects to it that aren't covered at all in, in this definition. The other reason why I do, like I leave out the D guys, is the word disorder. And it's now been stigmatized. I've talked to so many vets and say, I can't have that. Because no one wants to have a disorder. And it's really an injury. It's a natural, normal response to an extreme situation that happens to anybody. Uh, it's not a disorder. It's an injury. Let me move a little faster so we can get our other vets up here. Um, the Greeks knew all about the effects of war on the human heart, the Odyssey and the Iliad. <coughs> Iliad is about 10 years of war, Odyssey about 10 years of returning from war by Homer. I think these are probably familiar to you. Uh, documented effects of war. This is from the Iliad. And Achilles' friend Patroclus has been slain by the Trojans. Friend is not really the right word. Brother is getting closer. His love is as close as we can get. Not a sexual love, but a, a true love. Patrick's voice has been slain. And Achilles uh, goes uh, into a, a state of grief and rage, and he slays a bunch of others, and he, including the great hero Hector. And slaying is not enough. He drags Hector's corpse around the city, if you know that story. This is not the last time that this happens. My creative writing class, we just read Tim O'Brien's story, How to Tell a True War Story, about Vietnam. Uh, it is the same uh, state happening of an outpouring of grief and rage. And this is moving forward a few centuries. This is a Roman statue called Dying Gaul that the Romans conquered this part of France here. And, uh, Maybe hard to see, but this is where he's been stabbed in his injuries. Often that's how you'll see the classical. The body's very intact, the body very beautiful. There's a nobility. In fact, this is created not only to mark the triumph of the conquest, but also to ennoble the, uh, the defeated. We defeated a noble foe here. What would it look like if we did the dying? Ball for this one. War is different now with explosives, isn't it? It's very different. Uh, I've talked with so many vets, and they have picked up pieces of human beings. And so many vets. Uh, I was just in Will's office. You're going to get to meet Will here in a little bit. Uh, Will had a bag of boots in his office, has a bag of boots in his office. They've been used in a display, they're in combat boots. And we pulled one out and we could see that in the laces of one was a dog tag. It's actually Glenn's dog tag, the guy who'd been the vet navigator here previously. And this was uh, a common thing. Normally dog tags are carried around the neck, right? That little metal identifying plate. Why, why did the, the uh, soldiers in 
And these wars start putting them there because when the body is destroyed in an explosion, the feet remain intact and your, your body can be identified, or at least parts of your body can be identified and taken home. So imagine it's about 1928, 10 years after World War I. This little girl here is reading a history book. And she's looking at her father. She says, Daddy, what did you do in the Great War? Her brother is playing with toy soldiers and cannons. I don't know if little boys still do that. Probably not, although I know I'm watching football with my 20-year-old son, and every single commercial is a video game, a military fighting video game. Maybe the technology has just changed, the state of play has just changed. And the man has a, a haunted look on his face. Uh, he's not able to tell her what he did do or what he did see because uh, pretty common, right? Why would we not be able to tell? We need to protect them from certain things. Well, I can't go there myself about certain things. If you know anything about that war and the use of gas, uh, and other things here. In fact, guys, this poster was made uh, during the war and it was meant to shame British men into enlisting. Imagine yourself after the war and you have to tell your daughter or your son, I didn't, I didn't enlist, I wasn't a hero. Shame them into enlisting. And the troops in the field, I guess, found were uh, much disgusted by this poster. Um, Winslow Homer is an American painter, and this is called Veteran in the New Field, uh, 1865. So he's, he's a veteran, and it's very hard to see, but right actually here is his uh, uniform from the Civil War, right, guys? The Civil War here. And uh, it kind of shows a timeless issue, and when veterans come back from war, they, they need to find a new life. They also need to find a new identity, and sometimes they need to uh, rediscover values and find a way to connect. Uh, this painting, we might say, he's doing something beautiful and simple here, farming. What could be better? You could also say he's isolating. Like some of the events, this is a perfect occupation. I don't have to be around anybody. You might say he's symbolically hoeing the wheat, cutting down the men as were cut down in front of him. In fact, there's a famous area of the Gettysburg battlefield called the Wheat Field. Three days in Gettysburg, more men died than have been killed in our last 15 years of war. Three days, three days here. Um, is this an optimistic painting? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Um, so, what do you do when you come back from war? Well, you need to be connected with the community. And, uh, and I believe that studying the humanities, I've kind of given you some art, of history, literature, moral philosophy, uh, help you make sense of things, or at least explore your experience, realizing your experience is not unique, it's also part of centuries of experience, learn from others. You're not alone. Uh, other people have faced this exactly as you have here. We might recognize some of you in your teacher here. <laughs> so, uh, uh, yeah, Marsha was uh, our course that we started last April. We ended it uh, in uh, September. Uh, Marsha did the uh, for moral philosophy course. Help uh, uh, me out here. Donna, uh, Jen, and Crystal. Uh, Jen had been a corpsman attached to the Marines uh, in Iraq. Uh, Soli, uh, with her dog Bo, was part of this class. Explosive Ordnance Disposal. We saw the Hurt Locker. That's what they do. They defuse explosives, bombs that are found. By the way, every veteran I know hates that movie. Just in case you know that. Locker, so they have to make us look like cowboys and renegades and people are disciplined. I hate that movie. It makes us look bad. 
Uh, this was uh, one of the discussions we had in the critical writing and, and thinking class here. And these were three questions. And what do veterans sacrifice? What do veterans bring back to society? Old veterans. And we're connecting these with all of these texts we read in this class uh, from Homer to Hemingway, uh, Martin Luther King. And uh, three other folks uh, in this class here. You met, you met Kevin earlier. And uh, right now you're going to get to meet Will Schwab and Rodney Jones. Uh, wonderful guys who uh, were part of that class. And so I'm going to, do you guys want to come on up now? Sure, sure, sure great. <laughs> So uh, open it up for conversation now, and you guys can talk. Why don't you guys kind of introduce yourselves and tell us a little bit about your history, where you came from, and anything you want to say. All right, I'm Will. I actually grew up over on Bainbridge Island. I uh, came here for Running Start a long time ago. Obviously, there's some Bainbridge folks in the crowd. Um, not a lot of people from Bainbridge Island joined the military. I think I know three total. Um, at least from my kind of time period. I joined at 21, uh, wanted to do something, wanted to kind of just be a part of something bigger than kind of floating through college and all that. Um, and so joined also adopted, and my birth father was in the first Gulf War and was killed there. So kind of wanted to go see where he was coming from. Um, and then a month out of basic was basically told that I'm going to Iraq within a couple of weeks. So I went there, came back for a year, went back for a year, came back for a year, and then got out. And then went and lived in a cabin in the woods for almost a year. In the Army, right? Yes, Army infantry. Army infantry. Hey, I'm Rodney. I'm originally from Chicago. Uh, joined uh, the Army in my 20s. Um, got married and I needed money, so I joined and uh, I got to go over to Iraq almost as soon as I got done training and uh, I was a huge surprise because it takes a lot, a lot happens before, it, over there before it starts to sink in. And, uh, when I got out, I came back stateside and I was kind of confused on where to go, what to do, what, where am I now in life, and got spiritual and started to meditate and listen to uh, positive affirmations and stuff like that to get me back on my feet. And, uh, dealt with the VA a lot, which is quite a hurdle sometimes, but I'm glad they're there. Um, yeah, I was a combat engineer for about three years. Literally. You guys want to ask them any questions? Yeah. I have a question for you in a moment, but I just, I just want to say thank you, and thank you, Jeff. This is a fabulous presentation. Um, my husband is a Vietnam vet. He went under people circumstances. He went unwillingly because there was um, a lottery. Um, and I, I just want to emphasize the damage that this does to people, because my husband of 46 years now, um, has had contact with the vets. He's been he's, he's been in, in counseling over the years, and he still cries when people ask him about Vietnam. He still has not totally got it. He has a certain percentage of disability. He was he wasn't in combat either. Um, but when you're afraid that maybe you know you hear incoming rounds and you're afraid you may be dead in a moment, that creates post traumatic stress. Um, so I just wanted to say that, that it's just, um, anyway. And, and, and he's very upset by um, the wars that we've had more recently, that people have been sent over, and it sounds like maybe they voluntarily, but that people have been sent back <laughs> numerous times. He can't imagine having gone back to Vietnam after one tour. So the, the damage it's doing to people it, it was great. Thank you for listening. <laughs> I just had to get that out. Um, my question for you is, what is a combat engineer? Oh, we defuse ordnance and bombs safely. So um, it's going around with IEDs like Kevin was doing. 
diffusing, and sometimes we, we could do a surgery and hit the robot out, handle the bomb without us having to touch it. Like, I like the robot a lot. It's a sweat bullets. Working that job it was very stressful. back and even I'm sure going through your deployment would you still do it again if you could talk to your younger self would you or would you not do no it? chance I'm really? not a chance I, there are plenty of things that I would do absolutely anything to make them not have happened but I would never take that money. I like my experience 
experience, but I wish I was being more informed of what I'd be facing overseas. You had a question earlier. Uh, uh, never mind. I was going to add something to her, but I'm done. Uh, that's uh, basically what I was going to ask was, um, uh, do you think that maybe uh, it's more beneficial to, I mean, you know, you say, okay, 13 weeks at the beginning and then five at the end. 13 weeks is still almost nothing. It seems like, to me, that seems like a very short period of time to transition like that, but do you think it would be more beneficial for them to have um, discussions and um, something more not preventative, but proactive, like beforehand, rather than trying to, you know, fix it afterwards. You know, like, like the opposite of boot camp. Like yeah, or like, you know, it, like a, a boot camp for civilian life. Or just like you know, before you even go, before you even deploy, like you know, you you have boot camp for you know your physical and other things, but mentally and and you know emotionally, could they tie that something like that in beforehand, or would that be like, is it your? Are you just in a completely different mindset? You're talking mindset. about like a war fighting organization, right? So it's like a lot of that training is kind of getting you okay with the idea of having to do really horrific things right. or see really horrific things. But I don't think I think everyone comes back with different experiences. You might get a guy who had a tire who blew up and that was super super traumatic for him, or a guy who's like getting blown up every single day and getting shot at every single day and he's fine. So it's just, I don't know. It would be hard you to get. You can't really set a pace right. on it. Yeah. And there's also like a personal kind of uh, limit that you hit, I think, in my opinion, that, or if I if I hit this limit, I have to get help. But some guys just ignore it and they push themselves and they push themselves. And then they get out in the civilian world and they don't have any coping skills to handle all the emotions. It ends up being a suicide. You know, they're not asking the questions that are nurturing or helpful to the soul while they're while they're interns. It's really hard. It's almost like a godless organization being in the military. But after you, while you're there, um, I think uh, nurturing is important and before and after service. Mm -hmm. I want to go that. So I do want I do want to add. So you asked what kind of stuff should be available to soldiers after the military, and well, I have a huge opinion on this. And so when I got out, I was basically like handed a bill for all of the equipment that I had to rebuy because I had gone through it all, and then they let you go. So you try to go to college, and you can't relate with anybody. You look at a room full of faces of people that are 10 years younger than you, and you can't even talk to them because they don't know what you've been through or any of that. There needs to be like a, a college out process where something that, that soldiers can be together. Yeah, yeah, they should prepare you. They prepare you when for going, they should prepare you the for going. The whole time, kind of to piggyback on that, the whole time that you're in, you have your crew mm -hmm. and you're all fighting a common goal. Right. And then you get out, you have no crew and you have no goal. So it's kind of having that, having a backbone, a support structure, uh, that's kind of one of the huge, huge benefits of the Clemente course is that you have that <coughs> tight knit. Uh, uh, cohort and you go through the entire thing together so you all can share like you at least don't have to explain what an acronym means or like these little things that you end up having to explain when you talk to us about it. so I'm free to curse when you start humor too <laughs> oh yeah it, was, it, got, it got crazy you got some folks over there that want to um, this may be a naive question but I could ask you and, and Rodney what's your, your job what I, I, I get the sense of patriotism and some of the other reasons that people join as being back. I don't I can't quite get to the point of understanding why people volunteer to sign up for extremely dangerous jobs like being an engineer, like being a sniper. Um, you know, really dangerous or horrific. Choose to go in to this, to really about this situation. What 
Yeah. I mean, that goes beyond patriotism, I guess. Yeah, well, for one, one thing, I wasn't fully informed of my job responsibilities until I was start, until training. <laughs> so I was I was lured in very young and not informed. And uh, they, then they train you very well, but they don't tell you what the repercussions of your actions are. If, if you shoot somebody, if someone gets blown up, how you feel about that. Or if, if you're doing it to someone else, it could also happen to you as well. They, they don't prepare to just stay focused on your training and stay alive. It's basically what you end up doing. You know, just focus on your training and stay alive. Sometimes your decisions may made based on the videos that they have for that job on the recruiting website. So for mine, in infantry, it's like a bunch of guys with their faces painted, yelling, and kicking the door. Yeah, that's cool. We got to do that a little bit, but mostly we were picking up soon. So like you never see that on the video, right? So I think a lot of it's like you're just okay. I'm gonna join. Like I might as well do something fun, and that looked like a lot of fun. I don't think there's a lot of transparency. Before you kind of get into it. Which is intentional. Yeah, I mean, I don't think as many people would sign up for so. Yeah.
certain people might experience one thing and the way they perceive it is, is completely different. So I think it, it just really, I don't know. Yeah, it's definitely not weakness. It's not weakness. It's yeah. not everyone is affected very differently by different things. By the, by the background they bring to it. And uh, as Will said, some folks are affected by different Marcia, do you want to say just 10 seconds on Clemente? Anything since you were part of it there? So it was really interesting because I had vets in my class when I first started teaching. I had Vietnam vets. and. And then Will and I got to know each other in a class before Clemente, and then brought me and I got to know each other at Clemente. But that thing about how many times in our classes, just here at Central, all kinds of issues come up that are completely relevant to your experience. And yet, I can imagine how that would not be the setting where it feels relatable or maybe even very safe to talk about those things. And so I think that was kind of amazing about the community if you got to do all these humanities and yet you got to be talking to people who had some sense. I mean, the question I was going to ask them is, you know, with Clemente, we get your need to be with other vets for as we went through the courses. But when you're back here at Central, are there things that would be helpful for your teachers and for other students? Is there anything you sometimes wish, I wish they knew, or a response I wish they had? I think that's really broad, right? Maybe the other but nuts have any input on this? I know there's a handful. Um, whenever I got out, I had a really hard time transferring experiences. So like whenever people refer to something that someone's learned, it's different whenever you whenever you get out. So maybe taking a little bit more time to explain something. Because mm -hmm. not everybody just came straight out of high school. I have another question. Um, what type of adjustments you or family had to go through when you come? <laughs> no, I mean, they, they definitely, like, I'm a very different person than I was ever. Uh, and I think they understand that. My dad was in the military and between Vietnam and Korea. Uh, so he at least kind of understands what the military is about, but not on a conflict side of it. Uh, it's, I, I mean, I was in such a different place at the time that I don't think I was really even aware of I'm having to deal with it. I'm just trying to kind of survive and get through it. Well, it, it really changes for you. Like, um, a lot of us create a, create like a, well, for myself, for myself right now, it's like I created an alter ego because that was what protected me. That was, that was real. I'm George, but when I feel like I have to be in defensive mode and stuff like that, that's when I'd say that for kind of services. That's part of PTSD or whatever they want to call it. And like, um, when, I don't know, it's, you see it in a lot of our eyes. When you look at us, like, we're, I'm not the soft hearted person I'm seeing. When I speak, and if I speak in, if I'm speaking like and mad at you, mm -hmm. I'm not only going to try to hit the surface, I'm going to try to hit the core. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, a lot of us are in that, still in that mode. Like I'm still in that mode. Like I try to get out of it. And being in college, it it's it's kind of hard to. My mental health is kind of, it, I've only been out for two years, so I'm a lot fresher than these guys have been out. But I've only had two years, these guys have a like year or two more than I do. And I'm still having a hard time adjusting. Um, sometimes I feel like this civilian life was a mess for me. I got out and went back in. I took a break from service. And because I, I loved, I fell in love with that, that violence, I guess you could say. I fell in love with 
found us before. And because they did transition. No, they did. That's why you I you got you got stuck in there. Yeah, I fell in love before and it's also drug though. Like you the adrenaline side of it, like you're mm -hmm. never gonna touch that. Like, when but you get a call for a mission, you're throwing your gear on, like rolling out. Like he was saying, you get a big hit. Like he was saying, like he was saying before, like there's times that he would want to go back on and whatever. Even like I've been blown up numerous times. I've been blown up nine times. Yeah, I, I, my hands and legs and everything are all real. I mean, but I was burned. I not, you know, I'm a Purple Heart recipient as well. But if I can go spend one more day with my brothers and mm -hmm. like just. Uh, Good that one day just to be with them, just that day. I would. There's people that are gone now that I wish I could just go that one day. Just to, I would get blown up. I get blown up for, for the rest of my life every day. I could just be with brothers. Because you have that connection. Yeah. And out here, you know. That was that. And I'm sorry for being emotional. No, 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 no. It's, I mean, today is a bad day for me because I'm ever dead. Day, the right. first time that we killed mm -hmm. back in those times, mm -hmm. my mind was just not here. Mm -hmm. I wish I wish I could focus on school, but today I just can't. Mm -hmm. It's been hard. It's been kind of every year I deal with this bullshit. Sorry, excuse my language, but I deal with this bullshit every year. There's numerous dates that I best stick in my mind. Like a sort of, um, I just cannot knock him. It just will probably be me for the rest of my life, like your husband, dealing with the being oh, That is a long time ago, but some of us can't, some of us can't knock any of this. And I sometimes feel like I'm failing my, I feel like I'm, sorry to bring this kid in, but sometimes I feel like I'm failing my own instructors because I can't be there. She's one of my instructors, and she's awesome. She's an awesome instructor, and she, I felt like she understood me more when I told her that things were not right, that things were kind of rough. But I mean, this is what I want to what I want to tell you guys. I mean, I've been meaning to talk to Jed. I would have been on the side today. <laughs> no, but can you? Yes. Thank you.